Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and for this year's bonus Halloween episode, I'm looking at Hellfest, released in 2018. Hellfest follows a group of friends who go to a park full of spooky mazes and get stalked by a dude in a mask. Now, I may not be a haunt expert or anything, having only really experienced Universal's Halloween Horror Nights, <laughs> But I'm pretty sure the Hellfest shown in this movie would not exist in real life. I have a hard time believing an event this big and popular would also allow so much physical interaction between its workers and guests. Extreme haunts exist, obviously, but I don't think they're normally as big as a whole damn theme park. But who needs realism when you've got sexy teens to kill? Hellfest is a slasher to the bone, so if you're in the mood to watch a nameless silent killer with no personality stalk down and murder some kids, then look no further! Hellfest has got you covered. It was directed by Gregory Plotkin, who's primarily an editor, having cut all of the Paranormal Activity sequels, as well as Get Out and Happy Death Day. The second-time director had some veteran guidance, though, in the form of seasoned producer Gal Ann Hurd, which Hellfest's marketing notes was an EP on The Walking Dead, but uh, she also friggin' produced Aliens and The Terminator. I'd maybe tout those accolades instead. In addition to Hurd's involvement, Hellfest has a few other things in its favor as well, like realistic characters, amazing production design, and a cameo from the Candyman himself, Tony Todd. Unfortunately, Hellfest doesn't live up to its potential in the end, at least in my opinion. Other people have found it a fun and simple throwback to older slashers, but I guess I just get a little bored when there are too many chase scenes and dumb character decisions. And while I like the acting for the most part, you can tell that the cast was given free reign to ad-lib a bunch of their dialogue Dialogue. And sometimes it goes on for way too long. Wow. It's so quaffed. It really is. <laughs> it's so it's I think you should get one of those. I was gonna say, I think you should. Still, if you're a hardcore slasher fan, Hellfest is probably worth a watch. Also, ton of flashing lights in this movie, so if you're photosensitive, just look for the warnings and listen for the tone to know when they start and end. You know, this tone. How many people died after entering the gates of Hellfest? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with a haunted house at Orange Grove Community Fair Horror Nights. A few friends wander through the maze getting boo scared by witches and skellies until one of them gets separated. A hooded figure begins to follow her, humming Pop Goes the Weasel as he does. <laughs> When he catches up to her, he stabs her in the stomach with a knife. Sounds like she gets stabbed a few times there, but her ultimate death comes via hanging, as she's left among the haunt's prop bodies dangling from the ceiling. Cool, opening kill out of the way. Let's meet potential future kills. Final girl Nad is dropped off at the house of her bold and beautiful bestie, Brooke. Their friendship has been suffering lately, since Nat's a busy study bee who lives at home, while Brooke's gone off and made some snarky new college friends, like Taylor here, who don't care about any any grade that isn't the D. Some of us have scholarships, Taylor. Kind of need to keep mine. You kind of need to get laid. Taylor is played by Bex Taylor Klaus, who's been in a bunch of acclaimed shows, though I only really know her from the MTV Scream series. As unlikely as it seems to all of her friends, the usually reserved Nat has agreed to go out with them to Hellfest, a traveling horror night attraction with an entrance that includes a kick ass eyeball animatronic and a welcome message from Tony Todd. Good inner will come true. <laughs> they arrive and are given VIP wristbands by Gavin, a guy everyone's trying to hook up with Nat. And I've gotta say, the slightly awkward flirting between actors Amy Forsyth and Robbie Atal really works for me. They're very natural, and it helps the movie immensely during the long stretches where we're just kinda hanging out with these characters. Also helping the movie immensely is its production design. This place may or may not be realistic for a traveling Horror Nights carnival. Again, I haven't been to enough of them to say, but it definitely feels real, and completely bumping. No matter what you think about this movie, you've got to admit that it makes you feel like you're right there at Hellfest alongside the characters, getting scared by Chainsaw Guys, Cyberpunk Skeksis, and Darby Allen on stilts. It helps that it was shot in a real amusement park, Six Flags White Water Park in Georgia, which was closed for its off-season when production filmed in March. Since it was an actual full-fledged park, they were even able to make maps of Hellfest's layout. 
out. Also helping their credibility is that production designer Michael T. Perry has a background in real-life haunts, and was even an Imagineer who worked on Disneyland Paris' Haunted Mansion. But as cool as Hellfest is, it's not exactly Nat's usual scene, although she is certainly making the best of it. It's not that bad. Not the worst thing yet. It's not the worst thing yet, Nat. Cause little do you know, there's a dude walking into the park right now who's gonna be worse for haunts than McKamey Manor. Near a kick-ass giant rock monster guy, this mystery man sees a girl in a striped shirt unimpressed by any attempts to scare her. And actually, about that cool rock dude, he was lent to production by Netherworld Haunted House, a seasonal attraction near Atlanta that's been running since 1997. Netherworld also provided the 17 foot tall pumpkin king to rob zombies Halloween 2, as well as the haunted house Jesse Eisenberg runs through near the end of Zombieland. Their mega mouth prop is the dinosaur looking thing that chomped on a zombie. And a bunch of Netherworld employees also played scare actors in Hellfest, lending even more authenticity to this film's depiction of haunt culture. Since the stalkery guy knows that stripey girl paid to get scared tonight, he figures maybe he can help her get her money's worth. What is up with all these assholes? You think you're scaring me? Oh, you're so scary. No, move. Hmm, might have to try a little harder, dude. Why don't you go ahead and grab a sharp liability knife from that food cart right there? Nat and her enthusiastic group get spooked by sliders and streamers before getting to their first maze, Deform School. Their VIP passes apparently give them free reign of the whole damn haunt, allowing them to inspect and enjoy and even fuck with the props inside. Oh look, it's Linda from Evil Dead 2 and Zombie Ultimate. Ultimate Warrior? What? As their wacky friends run through the haunt at dangerous speeds, Gavin helps Nat overcome her fears by telling her how to spot scare actors. Just look at their hands! And with the secret code cracked, Nat begins to enjoy herself a little more. She even helps the scales fall from her friend's eyes. I just figured it out. Look, she just came out of here. Somebody else is gonna come out here and freak me out. Alright, thank you. Holy shit, Nat. You figured out that scare actors jump out from those black curtains in the wall? Damn, go get you a job with John Murdy. In a classroom part of the maze, they see that stripy shirted girl from earlier, whose name is Brittany, having a serious case of the tearful terrors. But they think she's just part of the act, an understandable assumption that leads to them telling the stalker guy, known only as the other, where his prey is hiding. The subsequent scene is too intense for Taylor or Brooke to watch, but since Nat has seen into the matrix of this place, she lingers to watch and even encourages the supposed scare actors to quicken the pace a bit. I can just do it. Boy, howdy does he! And after he sticks that serrated blade into the chest of poor Brittany there, Nat realizes pretty quickly that things might not be above board in this situation. She leaves the other and catches up with her friends, and the sight of another scare gag with a much less bloody conclusion only deepens Nat's suspicions towards the masked stranger staring at her and telling her to keep it down. Looks like he made a friend. Everyone else tells Nat not to make too big a deal out of it, cause the other dude is just a scare actor doing his job. Besides, they don't have time to worry. They've gotta get to another fun and game segment pronto. I guess this works as a time to mention the names of the other two dudes in the group now. Asher is kinda there with Taylor, his howling partner, who he's able to match in energy, and Quinn is Brooke's boyfriend, who's a, uh, I don't know, he's a guy. Honestly, they're kind of interchangeable, excited dude bro characters, but, you know, they're fine. They're much less shaded in than Gavin, whose growing affinity for Nat unfortunately can't inspire a better performance at these carny games. Having failed to win her a toy, he settles on buying her a pretzel, which they talk about in some of that obviously improvised dialogue I mentioned earlier. So what do you think so far? Um, the pretzel? Uh, no, not the pretzel. Could use mustard. I do want a piece of this. Oh, you're a mustard kind of girl? Mm -hmm. All that mustard talk gets them in the mood for a photo booth session, where they get way more pictures together than I've ever seen a photo booth take. Huh, maybe you get a few extra free for every base you run in the booth. The group is finally ready to go to the Deadlands, an extreme section of the park wherein the scare actors can touch you. But Gavin hangs back, promising to meet up with them later. Just be really fast, because she really likes you, you know? Okay. Well, and 
Thank Thanks, you're really hot. Right. She doesn't want to do that. I don't. I do. I'm Let's sorry. Let's go. Come on. I wasn't uncomfortable at all. Yeah, honestly, sometimes this dialogue works really well for me. That just seemed like a real moment. Gavin is hanging back to get Nad a stuffed animal, but he isn't able to convince the game runner to sell him one, skills unproven. Lucky for him, he happens upon the staff section where the animals are stored. And hey, I guess stealing is better than nothing. Right as he finds a stuffed toy from Trivia Murder Party, the other appears next to him, wearing that mask of his. I'm not the biggest fan of this mask's design, even though it was designed by Tony Gardner. You might remember Tony Gardner from Seed of Chucky. He played himself, the movie's makeup artist, and got decapitated by the killer dolls. His extensive work not only includes the makeup effects for Zombieland, but also the effects for Johnny Knoxville's Bad Grandpa. Not to mention the fact that he designed Daft Punk's friggin' robot heads. The other takes a carnival mallet and trips Gavin to the ground with it, then knocks him square in the face before pushing the would-be Romeo into position on a high striker. Step right up and let's test your strength, mister. Oh, he's a strong boy indeed. I like that they have a surprise first kill of the group. You don't really expect Gavin to bite it so early. The other takes Gavin's phone and sees that Nad is texting him. Hey Gavin, lend me a hand. No, just a finger? That works. Hey, what up, Nat? I'm your Gavin now. To get into the Deadlands, the kids all sign a waiver given to them by Riff Raff and board a ride that functions as the only way in or out of the separate park section. On the old school dark ride, when saliva's not being swapped, the kids react to the various scares around them with a variety of opinions. I don't like that. Not only did director Plotkin give his actors freedom with dialogue and action, Greg was really cool and he just said, hey guys, just you're a bunch of college kids in the maze, have fun. So he would kind of let us have free reign and just run around and do our thing. He also evoked genuine scares out of them by constantly having props and background actors scare them at random times. Just fuck you, man. The ride breaks down, leaving Nat stuck in her cart as the lights go off and a handsome devil voice announces technical difficulties. Please remain calm and try not to lose your head. But her problems are way more than just technical, since the other is now in the ride and walking straight towards her. But he doesn't want to kill her, he just wants to bum a ride, man. Because he's actually not the killer who's been following her, it just turns out that the other is the official mask of the Deadlands. The other will guide you on your journey. This hardcore section of the park has a bit more greasy grimer ghouly guts, as well as scare actors who are allowed to straight up kidnap random visitors. I'm gonna need her back, dude. On the bright side, the Deadlands does include free walking tours, which is great. It's really the best way to see all its colors. Their first Deadlands maze features three different tracks they can take. Not sure why those just wouldn't be separate mazes. And the friends split up by gender. It's an excuse to show us more of these mazes' production designs, I guess, which include gnarly floating green lights that you can make your fingers swim through, and a hallway with walls out of Day of the Dead. Shit, they've even got Dr. Satan in here. Dr. Satan! Somehow Asher gets completely separated from Quinn, and in a very dark part of the maze, in more ways than one, he's attacked by the other, who takes a needle and kills Asher with it in the worst way possible. He sticks him right in the eye with it. Oh man, and his little death twitches at the end? Sick. While waiting for Asher, Nat gets spooked and spit up on by a brundlefly, so she heads to the bathroom to clean herself up. She steps into a stall, and without even doing a TP wipe sits bare ass on the toilet seat. Gross. She shoots Gavin a toilet text, and after she hits send, she hears a notification tone from what must be his phone. That's cause this dude in the bathroom with some holy ass boots is her old friend, the other, and he needs to go to the bathroom. Nan is able to slide her way to freedom and escape, but the security guard she speaks to says he's unable to help her without any crime having been committed. You came here to be scared, right? I can't arrest people for doing their job. Welcome to Hellfest. Brooke and Nat want to leave right now, but they can't just yet, because there's a show going on. And the show's barker is Tony Todd, who by this point, you may have forgotten is in this movie. But here he is, in a dope-ass Dr. Facilier getup, ready to get this party started. Welcome, children of the night! His little show includes Taylor as an audience volunteer member who's condemned to have her head cut off. But hey, at least she's a good sport about it. Okay, well, bye-bye! 
Nat's not as comfortable with the guillotine gag going on, probably because she recognizes the headsman by his tattered ass boots. She rushes the stage to try to prevent tragedy, but while she wrangles with security in slow motion, the executioner pulls the lever and the blade falls down, cutting off an extremely obviously fake head. This actually really bugs me. We the movie audience, but also the live show audience, saw Taylor's real head on the chopping block there moments ago. When would she have pulled it back and replaced it with the fake dummy head? Would the live audience just have watched her like slide her head back and put a fake one in its place? If so, that's one shitty ass show you are running, Mr. Todd. The beheading's a big hit with the audience, but because of Nat's ultimate moment, security is scrambling to lock things down. That means none of them are around to stop the other from putting Taylor back into prime decapitating position and tying her down tight to the guillotine platform. He takes off his hood to show Taylor who she's dealing with, then once again pulls the lever and drops the guillotine blade onto Taylor's neck. But to his surprise, the blade doesn't cut her head off cartoonishly. And why would it, dude? That thing's not about to be a real ass blade. It's a good bait and switch, and it's pretty horrific when you realize that the other is just going to keep trying until he gets the result he wants. Unfortunately, the scene ends with another unbelievable moment only made possible through film editing. Since one minute, Taylor's tied down mere feet away from the killer, and the next, she's somehow gotten away entirely, despite the other, presumably, being neither blind nor deaf. Taylor runs into the crowd, screaming for help, but the public setting doesn't stop the killer from slashing her face with a knife. He then stabs her in the torso, and when Quinn tries to intervene, he gets the same treatment times too, giving us a pair of very sudden and unexpectedly simple kills late in the game. Just right out in the open like that, huh man? Our final two girls run away from the killer, though stupidly in the opposite direction of everyone else, and then inexplicably into a maze. I think this is an exit. Really? You think the entrance to a haunted maze, complete with a banner saying welcome to hell, is an exit? When did these realistic characters become so unrealistically dumb? Obviously, the killer follows them into hell, which was said to be the scariest maze in the entire park. And also the most dangerous, apparently, since it's got real damn axes lying around for any old killer to use. No weapons for you though, ladies. In a room with some blank-faced mannequins, the killer jumps out and slices Brooke in the leg. But Nat manages to hit him in the face, which lets them get away once again. They run into yet another really cool room, cause that's pretty much all this movie is at this point. Awesome production design and showing off these maze interiors. They hide from him under some masks, and after he chooses poorly with a random swing, Nat jumps out and strikes him down. The mannequin leg beatdown isn't enough to stop him though, and the other recovers and knocks Nat out with the axe handle. I guess he doesn't kill her though, cause now he's popping out of a Freddy Krueger wall to attack Brooke, and Nat is running around somewhere behind them. What the fuck happened back there? The other is all ready to kill Brooke, but before he can, Nat pops out from behind a wall and yells a cheesy line. <laughs> I'll give you two guesses, though, as to whether or not she double taps the guy. Hell, I'll even give you a hint. She doesn't. And so, after the cops arrive and turn on all the maze's lights, which honestly should have been done way back when two people got stabbed out in the open, the killer is nowhere to be found, having escaped through another fake wall to evade the searching officers. So, not only did both Nat and Brooke survive, but the unknown killer did too. He pulls into a suburban driveway and puts his other mask with a bunch of other masks in a garage cabinet full of them. Then he slinks into a living room where a little girl is sleeping and approaches her humming Pop Goes the Weasel, her favorite little ditty. Daddy, you're home! Yeah, turns out this guy's just your average suburban dad with a secret you wouldn't believe. Title card! Oh, got one at the end there! How many Hellfest goers would have fared better going to Firefest instead? I mean, the only way possible is if they had died, so let's see how many people that is and get to the- Ah! Did that scare you? The unexpected timing? Come on, let's go to the numbers. Six people died in Hellfest, and just to show that Hell's Gates are equally open to all, the three female and three male victims gave us a devilishly even pie chart. 
With a runtime of 89 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 14.83 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Gavin. I'm sad the only developed dude died so early but I love how unexpectedly violent it is. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Quinn, who was basically killed as an afterthought. Kinda like how his character was written. And that's it. Hellfest came out in 2018, and with this release, I have finally finished October. I hope you enjoyed the extra episodes, because now it's time for me to get some sleep and dial it back down for November, because, you know, I've also got a wedding to plan. Unfortunately for my work schedule, the first Friday in November is tomorrow, so I'll see you then. And until I do, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this smoky ass kill count. I want to thank some patrons like Robert Cube, Nicholas Hawk, The Only One, Marcus Tylehaz, Matthew Charland, and Justin Alexander. Yeah, I used a fog machine to simulate like being at a haunt. I hope it worked. I hope it didn't just make it look shitty. I hope everyone has a happy and safe Halloween tonight. Thanks everyone. Be good people.